right, welcome back everybody. I'm thrilled to introduce you to Dr. Schroeder. She's joining me today. We're gonna actually be talking about screeners and that kind of stuff, but she's got such a diverse background. I'm really thrilled to have her here with me today. Dr. Schroeder, welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Yes, I'm so excited for people to get to know you and shed some light on the work that you're doing. You have a really interesting foray into this work. Would you mind sharing everyone how you got into working with these kids? Yeah, well, actually, I am a Dutch pediatrician. So that uh, uh, tells you why I have this accent. Um, and uh, I have been from the beginning on really interested in brain development. So um, I was already involved in, in an uh, MRI study before uh, most of the hospitals had an MRI. So we had to bring our children actually to a, a research plant of a big uh, electrical company in the south of the Netherlands. Um, and then I did my PhD, which was uh, in, um, it was about uh, early born uh, children. So the, the, the really small preemies mm -hmm. and how they uh, developed um, at the age of five. And we looked at all kinds of um, parameters. One of them was language development, but also uh, their counting, visual spatial abilities, and so on. So um, from that on, um, I, I really uh, worked in uh, pediatrics. Um, and eventually, we moved to the US, and it happened that uh, our daughter uh, had really severe dyslexia. Mm. So that brought me even further into uh, the development of the brain development of children, but then specifically for those who have dyslexia. So I volunteered at the Neuhaus Center. We have a really nice educational center here in uh, Houston where they train uh, teachers and tutors to help children with uh, dyslexia. And I did some other um, interesting things there. At that moment, there was an uh, MRI study at UT, and I helped a little bit with that. And eventually, I was trained as a dyslexia tutor at UT. Yes. And they sent me out in uh, the community to all kinds of schools, and um, we implemented uh, research-based dyslexia intervention. It was really interesting uh, to do that. And then um, eventually, um, like I said, uh, I went from dyslexia to dyscalculia. Mm. There are um, enough or enough, there are a lot of dyslexia tutors and there is also a lot of information available for parents if they want to uh, read up on uh, dyslexia. And uh, it's uh, known in schools, uh, teachers and counselors are familiar with that, et cetera. And by looking at that, I connected again with my PhD where we also uh, looked into the counting and, and um, little um, addition that we already did with those uh, five-year-old children. And that was an issue. And the, uh, the thing what was really eye-catching to me was the enormous amount of research and um, resources available for dyslexia. Yeah. But now, if you have dyscalculia, that is a lot harder to find good information. Yes. So that is one of the reasons I'm, I'm very happy that you asked me uh, to participate because I really feel that um, if we can help uh, parents and teachers to get a little bit more information about dyscalculia, that is exactly what you're doing, that's fantastic. I think that is dearly needed. And uh, I think um, I help also appreciate it by, by people who, who look at this. So yeah, then um, I went from uh, being mostly interested in dyslexia into switching to dyscalculia, and I saw that there were some overlaps also. Mm -hmm. So it was um, it was not a really difficult jump for me. Um, 
but uh, since then, I am really working to raise awareness for, for dyslocalia, like similar what you do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm curious, what year was it that you decided to pivot into the math side? Um, that was 2008. And mm -hmm. for two years, I did not do any tutoring work. But then in 2010, um, we found the dyslocalia services, and it really um, only um, the tutoring and um, assessments for uh, dyslocalia yeah. and training, obviously, for, for teachers. Yes. Also. Because that That's was crazy. another thing that. Um, um, was very clear to me that you can work 24 seven, which I still kind of do because I also <laughs> work in the weekends because there is such a big need um, of uh, students, but also adults who need help with their dyscalculia. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not only uh, raising awareness, but we also need to uh, have more resources in schools and uh, more training uh, for dyscalculia tutors, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm glad that you're trying to help solve this problem because we are, we're about 30 years behind what's available in the dyslexia world. So it's, it's, I think now, especially with the technology, the way it is, we can maybe go a little faster, I hope, um, in getting these resources out. Well, and, and uh, dyscalculia is kind of standing on the shoulders of giants uh, because we have seen how uh, Orton and Gillingham um, really changed the playing field for uh, students with uh, dyslexia and um, their approach of having um, multisensory instruction actually even more so um, is important for uh, dyscalculia. So mm -hmm. it, it's not um, that you can say, okay, I do Orton Gillingham and then automatically everything works. Uh, yeah. As you know, there's a little bit more involved, but the approach that they designed uh, for dyslexia is, is very valuable. And yes, uh, we are kind of 30 years behind, but uh, if I now look at the um, speed of uh, research that's going on about this cochlea, we are making a catch up. It's going faster because all those things that we learn from uh, how to work with uh, students with dyslexia uh, has this, can, can be kind of translated into this cochlea, the approach, mm -hmm. not exactly the, the, the tutoring, yeah. but um, there are also a lot of people who work like me, interested in dyslexia first, who gradually said, okay, but we, there is so much of an overlap, and we know that around 40% of students who have uh, dyslexia also have uh, issues with math. Um, that is a, uh, an area that is not having enough attention. It's too long uh, on the back burner. It's really um, hurting those students that they do not get the intervention they need and more and more research is coming out. And I really feel that the whole thing of this cochlea is catching up mm -hmm. with dyslexia. So yes. it won't take 30 years before we, we are where dyslexia is now. Yes, I sure hope so. I am excited about the day when teachers will have at least heard about it and hopefully know how to help with it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. That would be excellent. So you had on your website like a screener, and I really thought because mostly parents are going to be listening to this, and we know some educators will listen to. But I'm curious if you could share what are some of the signs um, that parents and educators should be watching for. Right, right, and 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 those uh, may come as a surprise for some. So. First of all, what a lot of people are not aware of is that actually uh, you can see the beginning signs in the toddler age already. And if you go back uh, with the research, you can even say uh, something at the age of six months already. But um, that, is, that is just for research purposes. So what do parents and, and maybe also pediatricians, if they check up on 
little toddlers uh, notice that some um, three, two, three, four year olds are really late with counting. Mm -hmm. And they sometimes know what counting words are, but they kind of have their own order for it. So they count two, five, three, six, seven. And yes, they are counting words, but that is not in order. So ordering these words, that is already difficult for them. What you also might see is they rattle off like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Like one big word. You you know that supercalifragilistic mm -hmm. extracalidocious thing? Yes, yes. They do that and they think they're counting. And while they are doing that, they might point at three apples or six blocks, but certainly not exactly at ten. Mm -hmm. So that that connection that each counting word is one more thing, whatever you're counting, that is difficult for them to grasp. But other things is that they don't enjoy building blocks and puzzles. So don't dismiss that like, oh, my child is not doing that. So also directional words like it's under or next to or behind or um, before um, another um, mm -hmm. thing is already difficult for those toddlers. Now, and they're, they're disorganized. So now they go to kindergarten. And then again, the counting is still an issue. Uh, they certainly can count back. And um, they do not recognize the dice patterns or uh, numbers dots on dominoes. So when there's a game being played and there is dice coming out, those kids are trying to get out in the garden. They don't like that because they know uh, they can't do it that well. And it really uh, gives them some stress. And again, they keep. Uh, avoiding puzzles and so on. Mm -hmm. So when your kindergartner is not being picked up and get a few extra uh, counting uh, activities, they go to grade one and already start there with kind of a deadlock in uh, counting. And they keep, if you have uh, two plates with like um, Oreo cookies and they want to count them, they count on the whole time instead of counting all if you already know that we have three cookies you have two more then just say four or five they don't do that and mm -hmm. they count uh quantities that are higher than 10. so they also do not realize that the number is built up of smaller parts that actually a five is made up of a two and a three or a one and a four and they cannot put those numbers back together when they um, split them. Yes. And then you get the big confusion because between the teen and the teen numbers. Yeah. It's 14 or 40, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that is something that um, if teachers would be aware of that, uh, they could pick that up really early. And uh, that's why we also developed a uh, a dyscalculia awareness course. It's a very sh a short course. You can do it in one day. It's all online for uh, teachers and counselors and other uh, school officials so that they kind of see, oh, I, I need to pay attention to these uh, symptoms. And then obviously, if they go on grade two and three, uh, they have to keep counting on their fingers, make tally marks, they're unorganized, and then you have the big issue of the place value. They jumble that up a lot. Mm -hmm. But there is other signs that um, uh, are kind of unexpected, like they struggle to read a cl analog clock. Mm -hmm. And they often don't know left and right. And people do not necessarily associate that with math. They associate now with, okay, my child cannot memorize the multiplication tables, which is another really big thing for them. Uh, we see so many kids who have done uh, those flashcards over and over again. It really um, didn't work for them. It gives them anxiety, and there's a lot of frustration because parents are like, how is it possible that my first child 
knew all those multiplication tables in a few months. And my other child is already practicing this for almost a year and still doesn't know that, right? Can't do it. Yeah. It seems sometimes that those kids know it one day and completely forget it the next. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, we, we did this last week and it is as if it's a completely new thing for them. So that's another um, sign that you need to uh, look further into it. And also word problems become really hard for them. I, I have a long list. Uh, multi-step operations like long division oh my god oh, they, they the get worst. so confused with all mm -hmm. of that and then very often in school they explain it with all um ex long explanation and and they kind of lose it after the second sentence and i i don't blame them that's how their brain works they don't yeah. do it for purpose yeah absolutely and so this cost you, you made a screener that's available on your website and we'll link right. up to it below this video on the web page so people can go check it out. But I'm curious, how did you develop this screener? And just to be clear, so people understand what a screener is, maybe explain the difference between right. screener and like a diagnostic. Exactly. That, that's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy you, you brought that up because those words are, are sometimes uh, confusing. So a screener is a short instrument um, that gives you some basic information and is designed to decide if you need a real big assessment. And why is that? Because you don't want to have to do all uh, assessments for all uh, children because it's really time consuming and it's very costly. So you want to think before you go that route if it's necessary or not right mm -hmm. so we have we have two types of screeners the first one is a screening checklist and there is one for children and for adults now mm -hmm. it has been developed based uh, upon empirical data and they were gar gathered over a period of years working with children and adults who have dyscalculia and the items mentioned in there, the, 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 the questions, are known symptoms or early indicators that are translated from research. So basically what I'm trying to do is, because uh, of my background, I'm um, yeah, trying to uh, read a lot of research papers, translate that research, which might be uh, written in a little bit um confusing language with a lot of uh, lingo in it mm -hmm. into what can we actually use in our daily life how can we make this in a practical use for it so those screening uh, checklists have uh, not been scientific scientifically validated however 100% of those who scored high on those screeners and that after that were assessed for dyscalculia, they all had the learning disability. Mm -hmm. Also, all the people who scored high on the screener and were assessed by somebody else. So it's not what I only assess, but what was assessed by other people. Yeah, and then they, subsequently, they sent us what the uh, big assessment um, diagnosis was, and it was indeed dyscalculia. So now I have to say that we don't know about people who scored high on screener but didn't decide to do a test. Mm -hmm. So that is, we don't know that. But for those who did it, yes, it's definitely a good uh, indication. And then we have also made great specific screeners for kindergarten till uh, fifth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, where you see more that would actually the child can do those screeners, make some questions, and that gives you a more detailed uh, information. And then you said um, assessments. Mm -hmm. So what do you do when the screener indicates that there is a risk for dyscalculia? Then you can do two things. You can either go and do our uh, math and dyscalculia screening test and uh, 
you already hear the word test in there, it is a uh, more extensive um, assessment, both of number sense and calculation skills, because I feel that the number sense is often overlooked in a lot mm -hmm. of standardized uh, assessments. But the specific thing of this uh, online uh, math and dyscalculia screening test is that you get a specific level for each operation. So sometimes we see that um, a child can be um, on a level five or six grade for addition, but still on second or third grade for multiplication or for um, division. And the general tests give you an, an average of that. Yeah. So all the operations together yes. and they calculate an average. Now, that average is correctly calculated, but if you want to help a student, you want to know what to do. Yes. And you, you want to know a little bit more details. Yes. So yes. that is why we developed that thing. That is not all the other things that I mentioned were free. This one is 2750. It gives you a five or six page report mm -hmm. emailed to you. And when parents want to know uh, even more, um, we can go over the results together. And because my, my son and my husband together um, wrote the code for this uh, test, we can exactly see what questions were uh, difficult for that sure. student and what type of mistakes they made. So then they parents can get a personalized um, uh, review of that. But that obviously you need to pay my my yes, um, that makes sense. Yeah, you should be charging for that. <laughs> um, I love that. That in the twenty seven fifty. I mean, that just to give parent context, like that's very very affordable um, to get. Right an idea of a starting point and where to go from here. Um, totally worth your time and your investment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's there's over 400 people who did that uh, already. And I'm I'm analyzing the results uh, right now. Awesome. Oh, that's really interesting. I would love to hear more about that in the future. That would be really cool. Um, so in addition to all that testing and, and screeners and all of that, I know you also, you're a very busy and prolific creator uh, because you want to advance this work. So I know I have team members who I've sent through like your geometry course and they just raved about it. Um, and so when I was putting this show together, like, oh, you have to talk to Dr. Schroeder. Um, so we, we were definitely on the hunt to talk to you. But let parents and other educators know a little more about the education side of you training and, and helping people find methods that work. Yeah, so one of the things is uh, the Moms Teach Math uh, course. So um, if you want to help your students with homework and you see a lot of struggling, you can uh, implement already uh, some of the teaching strategies. And that's, um, that is a small course, uh, which is less than $50, mm -hmm. uh, has over hundreds of uh, downloads and uh, uh, links to games, what you can do. Um, but also, it shows you how to work with manipulatives if you have some, and that can be, that, that does have to be something difficult. You can just use pennies and paper clips and whatever you're playing around to the house. Uh, also, that you need to make it fun and and, um, and interesting and try to tie it to the interest of the child, which is obviously easier for parents to do. So those kids who are into uh, like uh, football, uh, you want to score for football for seven points and, and use that for multiplication, things like that. So yes. make it, make it um, connected to their daily life. That is one thing. But then also we go out to schools. We do a lot of teacher um, uh, professional development. Um, and that ranges from uh, one, uh, one uh, half a day to uh, three days. Uh, school districts uh, ask me and then uh, all the math teachers can, can participate and we do a lot of hands-on. So I show all the manipulatives that they can use. 
And then obviously our, our big project is the tutor training, what you already mentioned, uh, one part of it, uh, it has uh, five modules, there's a mm -hmm. extensive basic training and there's also an exam um, uh, after that. And we have several uh, extension models like you, you mentioned the geometry and the algebra and so on. And then um, uh, eventually what we like to, um, to do is uh, make a, a transition training for mm -hmm. um, dyslexia tutors so that they know that they can use what they already know about how to tutor a student who is struggling. They know all the psychological backgrounds and how mm -hmm. you can be a, a positive influence in their life because they really struggle with with anxiety and mm -hmm. uh, they sometimes start to feel uh, that they are not smart anymore. It, it eats away their self-esteem and all of that psychological approach that dyslexia tutors already know. That is not in our uh, this for this course. It's uh, really a transition course for dyslexia tutors because we we realize that there is an enormous potential um, in in our uh, dyslexia tutors, mm -hmm. and also because they already have developed a uh, a bond with their student. And now parents come and say, "Yeah, but you know." Uh, my child is also struggling with math. Could you help him or her also? And it's it's cumbersome for parents if they then have to start looking for another tutor for the dyscalculia. And just imagine the uh, scheduling. If you mm -hmm. have two different tutors for your child, yes, and and all the uh, after school uh, things that are going on, that's not working. Mm -hmm. So if you can combine that, if the Dyslexia tutor can also do the um, dyscalculia part, and maybe maybe they are not into doing the geometry and the algebra and the fractions, decimals, and percent. That's the next module. But at least we see that the dyslexia intervention happens uh, at a much younger age. Mm -hmm. They usually start in first and second grade because the teachers really flag up, like, hey, uh, Johnny can't read here. So, um, if you can in that time also make sure that they don't fall behind too much in the math, then maybe after a few years when the emphasis on the dyslexia is going away, another tutor might that is really uh, only into dyscalculia might take over from you. But then mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. those first years, the combination would be really, really effective. Yeah. Well, that's really brilliant. I like that you created a transition course. I think that's super smart. And I think a common theme I hear when I'm at least out presenting to dyslexia therapists, they're afraid to take on math. They have some of their own trauma in their past yes. about math. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right? And, and that is a big thing that we try to overcome in the This for This course, because particularly for the early years, um, that is, is um, it's very doable. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I hear from some of the people who did the basic course, they said, yeah, I was really concerned that the math was too difficult for me, but now I see it explained in this way. Yeah. Actually, it's not difficult anymore. Right. I wish I could have learned it this way when I was in school. Yeah. I also hear that from our adults because we, we, we shouldn't forget that um, children with dyscalculia, if they don't get intervention, they become adults with dyscalculia, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we also, and that is just finished, uh, made um, uh, a real life course, math in real life for adults who have struggled with math all their lives and they, they don't wanna, uh, sit down with worksheets and having to go through a math book. So they just want to know, okay, I'm in a restaurant, I need to pay a tip. Yeah. Or I need to have a new um, phone uh, and what is the best 
plan or I have a recipe and all of a sudden the, the, the cookbook said four people and there's 10 people coming. Now what? Mm-hmm. So those type of things, how you handle a mortgage, mm-hmm. that is what adults are interested in. Yes. So that was another thing that we, we worked on. And that, that, is, that is ready. The this for this is in production. But mm. I, I think at the end of the summer, uh, it will go live. Absolutely. Well, when, when it does go live, please let me know and I will update the web page and include links so that people can find it in the future for time to come because I think that's brilliant. Um, I've really enjoyed our discussion today and I'm going to have us wrap it up with a math joke and pun everyone knows and like my disclaimer they're not always good but hey <laughs> they make you chuckle and that's what matters. So do you happen to have one Dr. Schroeder? Well, well I, I have many but one of them is is the question why can't your nose not be 12 inches long? Why not? Why not? It would be your foot. Then it would be. Your foot. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, anyway. That's good. That was really good. Excellent. Well, Dr. Schroeder, thank you again. We'll have to have you back and we'll, I, there's so many things we could talk about. I think that's the hardest part about doing these interviews is I could just gush for hours and hours, but We'll call it a day. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me and for doing this for all the people and students who who really need uh, information about this Coquilia. Absolutely.